The answer. Listen to AM 560 The Answer online at 560theanswer.com on the AM 560 mobile app, on your Alexa powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. If you're looking for the latest news, insight into what it means, and the sharpest opinion, there's only one station in Chicago where you can turn, and it's this one. We're AM 560 The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. Uh, yesterday, Ukrainian President uh, Zelensky had a press conference at which he said the following. This, of course, through a translator. Take a listen. The Russian army is bigger not twice, not three times, but as of today, including the tanks and the number of soldiers is five, ten times bigger. The Russian army, especially the people, no one is counting them. No one cares how many die in the shellings in this war. You know that they brought crematoriums with them. Yes, they simply brought crematoriums with them. That is, they knew in advance that they were not going to show to their families, to their mothers, what happened to their children, that they died here, that they were killed here, that they came here to kill us, and we are defending us, our freedom, our houses, and that's why they are dying. We do not want to kill them. Why are our army taking them prisoner? And then our medics are treating them. Even yesterday, our medics were risking our boys that died from their wounds. They are people. Still, nevertheless, those me medics are, first of all, doctors. So for them, humanity comes first, revenge second. And that's reality. That's the difference between those that simply send cannon fodder. It's cannon fodder. That's why the two criminals crematoriums with them. Those people are bringing crematoriums and those boys are carrying those crematoriums. They understand that they bring something for themselves that is simply a nightmare. I simply don't understand what sort of person could plan such an act. That is Nazism and genocide. And I feel embarrassed that now we have 21st century. I feel embarrassed that today there were such acts and people say forget about this and that, about apocalypse, the end of the world, the end of the world has arrived. The end of the world has arrived. Um, those mobile crematoriums, you've seen pictures of them, pretty uh, ghoulish stuff. Uh, is there more that the United States can be doing to try to you know, level the playing field, if you will, that Zelensky was describing, the playing field where the Russian army is, you know, five to ten times greater in terms of personnel and resources than the Ukrainians. For more on this, we're pleased to be joined by Enrique Rick Prado. He's a paramilitary counterterrorism and special clandestine operations special a specialist with a focus on international training operations and programs. 24-year veteran of the CIA, recipient of the Distinguished Career Intelligence Medal and the George Bush Award for Excellence in Counterterrorism. His new book, Black Ops, The Life of a CIA Shadow Warrior. Rick Prado, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having us. So um, you heard uh, what uh, Zelensky had to say yesterday. Uh, we're not going to, you know, he obviously wants a no-fly zone and wants the West to enforce it. That's not going to happen. We're not going to send ground troops. Is there something in addition to the sanctions that the United States could do, um, perhaps clandestine operations, uh, that would uh, aid the efforts by Zelensky and the Ukrainians? Um, and maybe there is, maybe there are things going on that we don't know of, but if there aren't, are there things that could be helpful? Well, uh, first of all, it should be an effort not just by the United States. I mean, Europe has to have skin in this game. They are, um, it's their neighborhood that is on fire. Uh, yes, we're the world leaders, but uh, this is a team sport. We need to fight this as, as, as united as we can. Um, I, am, I, I agree with you that uh, putting tro our troops in front of the Russians is not conducive of any um, good solution. Let's put it away in this time. That would be an escalation. But we can, and I am confident that we are, because I've been in this business for almost 25 years, um, we are training them, we're providing them the intelligence that they need, 
and we've been training them probably for the last year. I mean, this, this Ukraine situation um, was coming. And uh, what, what amazes me is, man, is that we are surprised that Putin surprised us. Uh, it, 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 he has been what he is from the beginning. When he first took power, the first thing that he said was, I am going to reconstitute the Soviet Union. And what does that, call, what does that entail? The same way they did it before, taking over Poland, taking over the Ukraine. The communism, which is the antagonist of freedom, is known for being ruthless and it's known for being expansionistic. And anybody who w- was surprised by their activities, um, you know, we're not really focusing on it. So okay. I'm hoping that we are indeed giving them all the supplies and uh, logistics is the thing that they need the most, from medicines to bullets to fuel to medical supplies, whatever it is, we should be pouring that into the country. Well, all right, so we have this 40-mile-long Russian convoy. Why aren't the Ukrainians bombing that convoy? I mean, are we? can we give them you know, enough weaponry? Because we, we know it's there, they're just sitting there, and I, I just don't understand why nobody's stopping that. Well, you know, first of all, they, they are limited in the air. Uh, they, they've been taking some, some pretty bad hits from, from the Russians who have incredible long, long-range long capability with missiles and, and rockets. Um, but, you know, that convoy is stuck there. That convoy isn't just waiting. That convoy is, most, in my opinion, is most likely have run out of fuel and they've run out of food. I heard I, yesterday, I think it was, that they only brought three or four days' worth of food. Well, guess what? They're hungry. So, mm-hmm. but the other one, even when they do have the planes, sending the planes into that area is almost a suicide mission because you're talking the heart of where all these people are at. Yeah, Rick, you still there? I'm here. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, okay. that makes sense. Speaking of the the, the convoy and, and so these reports too, and um, you know, you have to question how much of this is wishful thinking, how much of this is reflective of the the reality on the ground, but a lot of reports of uh, low morale among Russian soldiers. And uh, Peter Schruck, who's a Yale law professor, suggested maybe there's something else the West can do to encourage desertion, um, offer temporary refuge in the West to Russian soldiers who want to leave the front lines, want to leave the Russian army, and allow them refuge in the West until the Putin regime is is um, overthrown and they can return home. Something like that, is that a legitimate tactic to consider? Well, you know, uh, Dan, it, it is something we shouldn't discard because, let's face it, we, we're in such desperate means, uh, needs, uh, anything that we can do. I know that we oh, are, are I'm confident that we're helping them with their... Uh, propaganda, uh, getting the word out. We, we have special departments that focus on just that. The, the morale in, in the Russian army has been low for a long time. You know, they are, they're second-class citizens. It's kind of like our military during the 70s where we were tainted with, a, uh, with the Vietnam uh, anti-movement. Uh, but you have to understand that for these guys to defect, they will kill them on the spot if they try to defect. Right. So... It, it, but is it worth the chance? Absolutely. And I, and I think that they should propagate that, that message that we will provide some kind of safe haven. Hell, offer a reward. Who cares? Um, and, and get, get them out off the, uh, off the ground because what that's going to do is if you have every unit lose one or two guys, well, that demoralizes the heck out of the rest of the team. It, is it po- you know, you're talking about how we didn't anticipate this. I mean, not just because of what Putin has been saying since the, he assumed the helm, but also because of what he's been doing from Georgia to Crimea to present. So is it possible that this was at, in part an intelligence failure to fail to anticipate when Putin was going to move, knowing he was going to move at some point? No, because he, his, what they exist are plans and intentions, and the other one is execution. I am confident of, of how much we know about his plans and intentions. Like I said, Russia is historically, since 1917, been a fully controlling expansionistic uh, government. And he has said that he was going to do this. So I think that we, intelligence-wise and politically, knew that this was something that could happen. Now, 
So, 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 so sorry, sorry to interrupt, but so if we know his plans, if you think we have a pretty good handle on what his actual designs are, then why don't we hear much clarity from sort of the foreign policy intelligence establishment about what they think he's going to do if he were able to secure Ukraine? Does he go to the Baltics or Poland or does he not? And by the way, a lot of those same establishment types that are populate the cable news channels were wrong about his intention to take more than eastern Ukraine, which he's obviously attempting to do. Well, without a doubt. And, and, but, but here's the thing. If, if we confronted him before he did anything, and I just accuse him of something like this, that is, that is aggression on our part to mitigate it. What I, what I think that has happened is he's had these plans in his back pocket now from day one. And like he did in Georgia and a, and a few other time, a lot of other places, when he sees that there's weakness in any opposition, especially in, in uh, us backing that, that situation, it, it, they're predators. Predators, when they smell weakness in, in the prey, they go for it. And I think that this is not something that, that it was unplanned. This was on the books, ready to when the opportunity was most favorable to him. And so do you think that w the response, not just from the Ukrainians, that does, doesn't seem to be, I mean, it may be overstated how poorly it's going for Russia, but certainly it seems pretty clear he thought he was going to be able to take that airport north of Kiev pretty quickly and then move troops in through there. And that didn't happen. And now this is a little bit more of a pitch battle than perhaps he anticipated. But do you, the combination of that plus the West response, do you think even if he is able to... Uh, uh, ultimately conquer Ukraine, that what has befallen Russia will inhibit him from moving past Ukraine? Well, here, here's one of the scenarios that I, that I hope that will actually happens. You know, he he has upset the economy of, of a country that's got, I think, is 100 uh, billionaires. Very powerful guys. Most of them are very hardcore people coming from backgrounds. So he has upset that apple cart quite a bit. Um, the economy's in the tank. Their, their, their ruble is, is worth nothing. So even if he does take over uh, Ukraine, which I know that that's his intention, he may not survive this. He may not survive this because, remember, the, the, uh, the, uh, the wall, the iron wall, iron curtain, went down because of their consistent failures and the attrition of, the, of their invasion of Afghanistan. It's funny because that's one of the few things I have. I've heard people talk about Georgia, but nobody remembers that they did the same thing to Afghanistan. Right. Um, before we uh, before we let you go, of course, we want to turn to your book, Black Ops, the life of a CIA shadow warrior. Um, the, uh, the the life and times of uh, Rick Prado and in the CIA. Well, yeah, the uh, the book is. Uh, I think it's, you know when I when I started writing this book, I had no idea how timely its release would have been because again, I didn't know uh, Putin's plans and intentions. But I'm, I'm I was I'm Cuban born. I saw the communist revolution of Castro take over the, the country. Mm. I saw what it did to my family. I saw what it did to my first country. The oppression, the assassinations, the complete destruction of any kind of opposition, and I witnessed that from seven to 10 years old. Um, so I know that monster. I've seen what, what communism is. Subsequently, when I came to the United States, um, I immediately developed a, a, a debt of honor. When I came to a country, um, I came by myself, by the way, but my, my parents couldn't get out at first, so they sent me forward to an orphanage in Colorado. But very, very shortly thereafter, I, I started realizing this, this is an incredible country. Once my parents got out, I, but below the poverty line, working two jobs, my mom working sweatshops. But we got into the American dream. And that's what I said to myself, we need, you know, I need to do something to pay this country back. And I've been doing this for 50 years. I went into the military when I was 20. I did 24 and a half years in the agency. I did 10 additional years after that. And this book is my last firefight. I literally thought that this is something that needed to be heard because my agency is the most maligned agency in the federal government. The only thing people know about the CIA is what they see on Jason Bourne, American-made, these Hollywoodized uh, backings that, that we allow them to fill. 
So my book, in my book, you will experience real CIA operations. And I'm talking some high-speed stuff done by real CIA operators um, without the Hollywood part of it. There's, um, I, I was pleasantly surprised to see how much they allowed me to, uh, to leave because my book is fully cleared by the CIA. And I think the reason is that I very upfront told them, I said, my, the, the purpose of my book is to educate Americans that they should be proud of what the agency does. You know, Dan, we have 137 stars on our wall, and we're a small organization. We're not like Big Army, Big Navy. 137 stars that represent men and women who have given up their, their lives for this country, mostly anonymously. And I take exception for those souls to be maligned. Of those 137, a third are after 9-11. And several of them, like Mike Spann and Jennifer Matthews, were friends of mine. So this book is, is personal. My life uh, fighting communism and fighting terrorism, we call them the isms, is, it will continue for as long as I can. Uh, so I think the book is very timely. I think you will see uh, what I, I fought them in Nicaragua. I fought them in the Philippines. I've been fighting communism since for, for my whole career. Wow, that's good stuff. Um, and uh, just just out of curiosity, is there any TV show or movie uh, that where the CIA is is featured that you think <laughs> at, at least approximates it, like Homeland or anything like that, that actually approximates some of the work that people like you did over the years? Absolutely not, and, and definitely no. not Homeland. Okay. Uh, okay. Definitely not Jason Bourne. Um, I, there's there's one movie, and it's, it's a little dated, that shows operations overseas called Argo. And oh, yeah, sure. During the, uh, the American crisis, yeah, yeah. how we get, where, where we get these people out. Um, that is a very good, positive depiction. But the, 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 what people don't understand is that the CIA does do some incredible operations, and I think my agency has to open up a little bit, and when they are, when we can talk about past successes without compromising sources and methods, we owe it to our, 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 our men and women who sacrifice daily unsung heroes. We uh, could have a better opinion of, their, of our organization. He is Enrique Rick Prado, a 24-year veteran of the CIA, as he was describing, recipient of the Distinguished Career Intelligence Medal and the George Bush Award for Excellence in Counterterrorism, Pick up his book. Don't watch those movies and TV shows. The book, Black Ops, The Life of a CIA Shadow Warrior. Rick Prado, thanks for joining us. Good luck with the book, and thank you for your service to our country. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dan and Amy. Thank you for having me on. Take thank care. you. And thanks for what you do. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's news, opinion, insight. This is Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560. The Answer. Listen up. You got tax problems, you want the IRS off of your ASS, whether you're an individual or a business and are having problems with the IRS, let PJN Tax Solutions Group help you solve your problems. We aren't one of those large, out-of-state 1-800 firms. We're a local tax resolution firm located here in St. Charles, Illinois. Our fees are fixed, so there's no ugly surprises at the end of the engagement. 